Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to my talk on Flannel, Calico, and Canal. Um, as I said, I'm Tom Denham. Online, you can uh, find me with the handle Tom D. Uh, so I'm a maintainer on the Flannel, Calico, and Canal projects. Um, quick poll of the room. Who here uh, uses or has tried one of these projects? It's good to see quite a few hands up. Uh, who has contributed to one of these projects? One person, awesome. So uh, the goal of my talk is to try and get more hands up, to get more people to, uh, to contribute to, uh, to these three projects. So a year ago, I did a talk at Corus Fest in Berlin, uh, where I was talking about flannel and calico and how they could be used together, um, i.e. canal. Uh, so this year, I'm gonna give you an update on uh, those two, uh, or these three projects, flannel and calico, uh, and I'm going to talk about ways that you can contribute to these projects, try and give you some concrete ideas for the sorts of things that, um, that we, the maintainers, are looking for. Uh, and then I'll talk um, a bit about some of the mechanics there, uh, some of the development workflows I have for actually making changes to and, uh, and testing these projects. Uh, so I'm actually going to start with giving you a little bit of background uh, on why you might want to use uh, flannel or, or calico. So the problem we're trying to solve uh, on a Kubernetes cluster, you have a lot of servers and you have these workloads, these pods running on your servers. Uh, and the Kubernetes networking model is that each pod gets an IP address and they're all in a big uh, flat layer three address space. So they all need to be able to talk to each other uh, and as a developer, you don't really care about the servers. You just have all of these workloads, these applications running on your cluster, and you want them to be able to talk to each other. So providing that, that easy networking, that's the first problem that these projects are trying to solve, the, uh, the networking. Uh, but letting everything talk to each other um, isn't great from a security point of view. So you can use network policy to uh, actually only allow the connections that your applications need so reducing that, that dense graph to a, a sparse graph, uh, and that's going to increase the security. So that's the, the second problem, is the, uh, the network policy. So Flannel is trying to solve that first problem. Uh, that's what it's focused on, the, uh, the networking. It's a relatively mature product in, uh, or project in, um, in container years. It's been around for, for about three years now. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so what is it, How what does it look like, how do you run it? So it's written in Go, um, it compiles to a single binary which you can put in a container uh, and you need to run that on each host in your cluster. Um, you need to provide two uh, key pieces of global configuration. So one is a range of IP addresses that your pods are gonna use for your cluster and the second is the back end, the networking back end that you want to use. So uh, when your, your daemon runs uh, on a node, it reads that global config, and then it has two main jobs using those two bits of config. So the first <coughs> is maintaining a, um, a per host IP range carved out from that, that global um, cluster wide range. And that's an important integration point. It, um, it writes that uh, that IP range to a file that other things can consume, such as the Flannel CNI plugin. Uh, and then the second job of the, the daemon is doing the actual networking, where it has this pluggable backend system. Um, so the kind of the contract it has there is, um, if you send a packet uh, from that host or from a, um, a pod on that host to an IP address in that global cluster range, then Flannel ensures that you can reach, um, that, that packet will reach the right destination. So there's a choice of different uh, networking backends that you can use. Uh, I recommend for most people that you just use the, uh, the VXLAN backend. Uh, provides a really good balance of performance and compatibility. Um, it'll run on any modern kernel. It does the encapsulation within the kernel, so it's pretty fast. Uh, and will run in the cloud because um, the cloud can't see the, the IPs, the cluster IPs you're using because it's uh, encapsulated. Uh, there are these other backends, so the UDP backend, which um, is much slower because it's doing the encapsulation in user space, 
uh, but it is more compatible. It doesn't rely on any kernel features. Uh, and the host gateway, which uh, requires layer two connectivity on your network, so it won't work in certain cloud environments. And then these, these various uh, cloud integrations, which also have uh, restrictions. So um, most people, VXLAN is, is the best choice there. So what has uh, changed in the Flannel project in, in the last year since I was talking at CoreOS Fest? So one of the biggest changes is better Kubernetes integration. Uh, so previously, um, Flannel uh, stored that global state and that data in an etcd backend, but that could make deployment uh, difficult. All of your Flannel daemons need to know where to find etcd and how to contact it, have the right credentials. Um, so this change, which was actually contributed by um, Mike Denise, someone from the community who works for Google, uh, means that the um, uh, the, the Flannel daemon can talk directly to the Kubernetes API and it stores the information it needs as uh, annotations on the node objects. And that means that uh, Flannel can be deployed in a daemon set and Kubernetes actually handles the problem of uh, telling the Flannel daemon where to find the Kubernetes API and giving it the right credentials to do that. So deployment uh, doesn't really require any configuration, then you can just run this, uh, this manifest and, and it all just works. So, uh, so that's great. Um, otherwise, I've done five releases uh, in the last year, the Flannel project. Uh, I did a release candidate um, a couple of weeks ago for v0.8.0. Uh, there's quite a few changes in there, some refactors, so I'm really interested in hearing people's experience with that, if they've tried it or if they can try it and let me know um, if there's any problems. Uh, the final release should be in, uh, in a week or two. Uh, and in the last year, there's been uh, over 100 PRs merged from across uh, 41 different authors, including me. Um, then other interesting stuff, been trying to overhaul the documentation, um, working with the, the team at CoreOS for that. Uh, and that's uh, still in progress at the moment, but hopefully you've seen some of the, uh, the improvements there already. So, uh, so that's the, the networking problem, uh, which Flannel's focused on. So I want to talk about Calico now, and Calico actually solves that networking problem as well. Uh, it has a focus on BGP, the, uh, the border gateway protocol, for solving that, that networking part, and it runs a, a BGP daemon on each node um, either bird or go BGP. Um, but Calico also does the second problem, network policy. So that's what I want to focus on here. So Calico implements the Kubernetes network policy API. And on the right there, um, I've got an example of what network policy looks like. I'm actually gonna demo this in a minute. So I'll talk that through in a bit more detail. But the, the important bit is that you're using these pod selectors and uh, labels on your pods to kind of select that connectivity graph saying what things can talk to each other. Um, and uh, to implement that, Calico runs an agent on each host, uh, again written in Golang, which we call Felix, um, carrying with the, the cat theme. Um, and worth noting that Calico does support a richer set of um, policy capabilities than the Kubernetes API exposes, and they can be used um, uh, inserted using the Calico Cuttle tool. So what's changed with the Calico project in the last year? So similar to Flannel, the um, major change has been this Kubernetes data store support. So again, making it much easier to deploy um, on Kubernetes, so that's great. Uh, there have been five major releases of Calico and lots of patch releases. Um, had commits from um, more than 70 new people in the last year. And we have a, a Slack community for Calico, and that's seen a, a quadrupling, and there's over 1,000 people on there now. Uh, one other development in this area in the last year has been the, the Kubernetes Network Policy API, where um, I think possibly when I demoed this a year ago, it didn't even quite exist, and it was implemented using third-party resources. Um, but it's quickly alpha, uh, and currently in beta, but the PR making it the, the final version has just been merged. So in Kubernetes 1.7, um, there'll be the, the final version of this Kubernetes network policy. And my colleague Casey Davenport, is, um, who co-chairs the, uh, the Kubernetes networking special interest group, has been uh, working to make all that happen. 
So I've talked about flannel and I've talked about calico. Um, what about canal? So we uh, launched canal at Core Fest last year, and I think uh, it's safe to say that that caused some confusion. Um, I think there was a perception among some people that maybe the canal project was going to replace calico and uh, flannel. Um, so I want to try and clear that up and say that it doesn't replace those projects. Um, calico and flannel continue to exist as their own projects, have their own GitHubs, uh, own release cycles, and they'll continue to do so. Uh, canal is just a packaging of these two projects together. Um, so for Kubernetes, um, that means that uh, we have a manifest file that uh, just makes it easy to deploy them together in a single pod um, as a daemon set. It's taking the unmodified Calico code, the unmodified Flannel code, pretty much the unmodified individual manifest files from those two projects and just mashing them together, but in a tried and tested way. So if you're going to use them together, then, uh, then I recommend using Canal, but you don't have to. It's uh, unmodified code. So I want to uh, demo this networking and uh, network policy to you now just to make it a little more concrete. Uh, I'm going to do it on my laptop um, using Vagrant. I don't want to rely on the conference Wi-Fi here. Uh, so I have a Kubernetes cluster running already, which has three nodes, N1, N2, N3. N1 is the master. Uh, and I created this cluster using uh, KubeADM, which is a great tool for creating uh, dev clusters, demo clusters, this kind of thing. Uh, for production, obviously, you'd want to use something else like Tectonic. Um, so I have that running here. So I can show you um, is that font readable at the back. Can people see it? Yeah. Um, so I, I have the, the Kubernetes components all running on this cluster already, uh, but I don't have um, Canal deployed yet. I don't have Flannel and Calico. So to deploy, it's as easy as running this kubectl apply command. So let's try that. So that creates the, the daemon set um, and the config for it. And if I rerun my get pods command, it should just take a few seconds to come up. take a few seconds to come up. Uh, let's take a look at the, uh, the YAML file while wow, that's happening. Uh, so the, the YAML, f the, the manifest file for deploying Canal has a few important pieces. So it has the CNI network config here at the top, uh, which is this section at the top. And then it has the flannel config. So here I'm defining the IP range that I want to use and the um, the backend type that I'm using, so the XLAN here. Uh, and then it defines this daemon set where um, the pod contains um, the, the canal components, so calico and flannel. So that's calico at the top and uh, a script for installing CNI plugins and then flannel at the bottom. So hopefully my pod. Okay. So I can't demo this because my uh, images aren't being pulled for some reason. So I have a video backup, hopefully. <laughs> I might just run command. wouldn't know the difference. So um, here are my pods. <laughs> and I'm applying the canal YAML. Um, so all this, this worked every time before. All this code is available on GitHub, so you can try it out for yourself. Container creating, uh, I have to wait a little while, and then hopefully we'll see that, at least in my video, it works. Please. <laughs> yes, OK, great. So uh, I have the canal components running on my cluster now. So that's using Flannel for the, the networking and um, using Calico for network policy. So now that I've got that running, I am going to deploy an application onto my cluster. Um, so I'm going to deploy my app looks like this. I have some front ends which are written in Python. 
Uh, I have a data store, which is running Redis, and then I have a client, which is just the curl program. Um, and initially, everything is going to be able to talk to everything, um, but then I'm going to apply network policy to uh, restrict the connections. So let's see that running. So um, I'm going to start by creating a network name, uh, sorry, not a network name, a namespace called demos, and that's where I'm going to deploy all of my uh, pods and services. So then I'm going to create uh, Redis using um, a replication controller, and I'm asking for a single instance of Redis, um, and it's just the, the Redis Alpine image. I'm not making any changes to it. And then I'm going to put a service in front of that. Uh, so that's deployed, uh, service in front of it, um, so I get a DNS entry for it. So I can apply that, and then I should be able to check that that's running, and I can see uh, that that's now running. So I have my data store deployed. Now I'm gonna deploy um, my, my front ends, which is this, um, this Python application. So it's just a simple Flask app uh, that is going to connect to Redis using the DNS name, and uh, it's going to create uh, increment a bucket on Redis called Money Earned. And if it fails to connect, it's going to print this error message saying failed to connect to Redis. And if it's successful, then it's going to print this message saying uh, account of the, the company funds. So I've wrapped that up into a Docker image. I have a, a manifest for that. I'm going to deploy it. Um, five replicas of that under this replication controller. Um, so that's now deployed, and then I'm gonna put a service in front of that as well to load balance across it. So that's now deployed. So I can check my replication controller. I can see that um, five current, five desired, five running. So that's, that's all running. And I can do kubectl uh, get pods and see that those five front ends and my Redis are running on this cluster. So now that I have everything running, I can start sending some requests to it. So this is showing flannel networking. There we go. Um, so I'm just running curl on the master node. This is simulating my client. It's talking to the, uh, the, the service IP for my front ends. So I can see these requests uh, printing out the company funds, incrementing each time I call the API, and it's talking to a different server each time, or it's striping across the different servers. So um, that's, that's great. Flannel's working, the networking's working, uh, but I can also access Redis directly, which isn't so good. So a malicious person could come in, run this Redis CLI command there on the right, and set the money earned back down to zero. So $12 that I earned have just disappeared, so that's no good. Uh, but that's where networking policy can come in and, uh, and restrict these connections. So I'm starting off with no network policy at all, so my kubectl get network policy um, says no resources found. So I have this network policy defined, <coughs> which is, uh, has this pod selector at the top, which is going to select all of the pods that match the label demo Redis, so it's gonna select my one Redis pod. And it's going to allow traffic to that pod that comes from other pods that are labeled with the demo front end um, label. Uh, and only on that specific Redis port. So it's restricting it down to uh, only receiving traffic from exactly where it should come from and only on that port, uh, that specific port. So I can apply that. And then I'm doing a similar thing for the front end as well. So I want kind of anyone to talk to my front end, so I'm not gonna restrict where it can come from, but I am gonna restrict the port that can be, uh, that can be used, so port 80. So I can apply that. Um, so that uh, policy I've created, there was no interruption in the traffic on the left, but the policy isn't actually applied yet. To turn on network policy, currently you set that per, uh, per namespace, you turn on network isolation there. Uh, I think that's actually changing with Kubernetes 1.7, and this step won't be necessary. Uh, but so once I, I turn it on and set the isolation policy to default deny, when I apply that file, then we should see that um, traffic still keeps flowing. There's no interruption because I've put the policies in place to allow 
all of the traffic that I expect. But crucially, if I run that same uh, Redis CLI command to try and set money earned back down to zero, it's just timing out and I have to kill it. Uh, and then just to prove that network policy is actually doing what it's meant to do, um, I can uh, delete the network policies. So if I remove the policy that allows um, the front end to talk to Redis, then I can see that curl starts printing this message saying that it failed to connect to Redis. Uh, and then I can remove the policy that um, allows traffic to the front end and eventually I should see curl timing out and uh, not allowing traffic to the front end anymore. So that's, uh, that's what I wanted to demo for that. So hopefully I've shown you that it's easy to set up um, Kubernetes cluster and add Calico and Flannel to that cluster and then a, a quick demo of network policy uh, and how you can use that. So now I want to talk about how you can contribute to these projects. Um, so they both follow a standard GitHub process. Um, so you can fork the projects, uh, make your changes in your fork, submit a pull request, uh, me or one of the other maintainers will review that, uh, and if it's good, uh, then we'll merge it. Uh, we also use GitHub for uh, issues, so you can raise bugs on there, uh, and also support requests and uh, enhancements are, are tracked through GitHub too. Uh, we also have uh, Slack available for interactive discussions. Uh, you can sign up at slack.projectcalico.org, and there's uh, Flannel and Calico Dev channels on there for discussing those projects. So I want to talk a bit about specific ways that um, I think the community could uh, contribute to these projects. So um, me and the other maintainers, we're a relatively small group of people compared to all of you guys using these projects. So I'd love to kind of leverage all of your combined knowledge um, to try and uh, make these projects better. So I'm not an expert, for example, in uh, packaging. So I don't know, making Fedora packages or something or uh, packaging Kubernetes applications up with Helm. Um, so hopefully someone in the audience is an expert on those things and uh, I'd love to kind of leverage that knowledge and, and have you contribute that so that everyone can benefit from it. Um, similarly for uh, platforms, we had IBM contribute uh, S390X support, uh, so mainframe support. Uh, you know, I don't have a mainframe in my basement, so that, that kind of stuff is kind of hard to work on. Um, so it's great having the community who care about those different platforms um, kind of own and contribute that stuff. Uh, and testing, so we the maintainers work very hard to try and uh, test these products before we ship them, um, but we can't test in every possible uh, scenario. You, know, you guys deploy on a whole diverse range of, um, of environments, so, you know, it's really important that you raise bugs when you hit them so that we can fix them and other people can benefit from that as well. Uh, and documentation, you know, I've been working on these projects for, for years, so um, I try and put myself in the shoes of novice users and new people coming to these projects, but sometimes I can miss the mark. Um, if you've come to this project and you've, you've found things confusing, uh, but you know, maybe you've got through that and learnt it, then it, it's great to, to share that experience, um, raise bugs or raise issues to let us know uh, what was missing, uh, or even better, create pull requests um, to actually make those changes yourself. Uh, there's no pull request that's too small. I really like small pull requests. I can review them very quickly and get them merged. And that one clarifying sentence that, that you can add can help lots of other people. So it's really great to, um, to contribute those things. Uh, and then, of course, we have lots of issues. Everyone has issues uh, on GitHub. Uh, some of them are tagged with the, uh, the Help Wanted label, so they're great places to start. But really, any of the issues on, on GitHub um, would be great things to fix. Uh, so kind of hopefully that's shown there's a lot more ways to contribute than just writing code. Um, I think it's worth saying for, for bigger things, especially big code changes, if you just drop a big PR, um, raise a big PR on these projects, um, it's going to be really hard for me to review that and engage with that and kind of make the judgment on whether the increased complexity that that feature is going to bring is worth it for the project. So if you can engage with the community first and try and get buy-in for um, the feature that you're adding, then it makes that judgment for me much easier to know whether it's worth, uh, whether it's worth taking. 
So, um, yeah, talking to us on, on Slack or um, raising uh, an issue is a great way to start that. So future work, so um, kind of from my perspective as a maintainer, all of those things I pointed out there are really great things that I'd love to see happen. Um, but there's certain things that as a maintainer, I know that I need to drive as well. Uh, so documentation is constantly evolving. As I said, for flannel, we're kind of halfway through a big rework there at the moment. Um, so hopefully I'll keep that going. Uh, the release process, um, I'd like to make improvements to the release cadence, make it a bit more predictable, uh, and improve some of the communication around releases. So uh, letting people know when a release is coming, exactly what's in it, and um, uh, yeah, some of the details there. Uh, and then of course, we have issues, so fixing all those issues as well um, is important. Uh, and then one other thing to mention is uh, service meshes. So Istio was announced last week, um, and uh, Calico um, is working on that already. Uh, I think there'll be a lot more work there in the future. So getting the service definitions um, from Istio, complementing those with the lower level uh, network policy that, that Calico provides. And we have a demo of that already on our blog. Um, the links are there. So I want to talk now uh, a bit about some of the, the details of working with the code. Um, so I'm going to start with Flannel and then move on to Calico. So Flannel is written in Go. It's reasonably small, so it's quite straightforward to work with. Um, it uh, has a, a fairly quick kind of uh, compile cycle because it's written in Go. So if you can work on it locally on your, your Linux box, then it's reasonably straightforward, but actually it's part of a distributed system, it's doing multi-host networking, and that can make things uh, a lot more difficult, uh, especially when you're trying to run it under Kubernetes as well. So um, one of the techniques to help with the uh, multiple servers part is there's some bash scripts that are checked in uh, that run the functional tests that kind of emulate multiple hosts uh, using Docker containers. So that's a, a great place to start if you're trying to test uh, on multiple servers. Uh, and then for Kubernetes, um, if you need to test it real, for real on, on a, a cluster with multiple hosts, then using uh, kubeadm is great. Uh, but if you're just testing the Kubernetes specific parts and can test that on a single host, then uh, Minikube is, is good as well. So Minikube is a kind of mashup of Vagrant and Kubernetes. Uh, it provides you with a sort of a standard environment for Kubernetes uh, running in a virtual machine. And I've encoded my workflow there uh, in the flannel make file to try and share that with people and uh, allow people to get started with the testing. Um, so really just kind of has the commands in the make file. There's nothing too interesting there. The one interesting bit is the uh, building the image. So it does a, a go build to, to build flannel, but then uh, when it creates the container, it's actually creating that using the Docker daemon uh, from Minikube. So the image is is built within Minikube, so there's no separate kind of pushing it up to a container registry and pulling it down step. Just makes that um, cycle uh, a bit shorter. Uh, so then the other thing I want to mention with uh, Flannel is a new backend that I've written, uh, which I'm calling the extension backend, uh, which is used for prototyping new data planes. So this is really just to scratch a personal itch for me. Um, I was kind of inspired by talk that Cornelius Keller gave at CoreOS Fest last year, where he was integrating Flannel with Tink VPN. And he, he did that by running uh, etcd cuttle, the command line tool, um, and gluing it together with a load of bash. And it, it kind of worked, but it was sort of complicated. And I thought, wouldn't it be great for the, the Flannel project to offer a bit more support for that kind of thing? So using this lets you quickly iterate on um, new data planes uh, just using shell scripting. So Flannel does have a pluggable backend system, but you need to know Go, you need to write to this um, reasonably large interface. It has a high barrier to entry, so this should try and lower that, that barrier and uh, allow more experimentation. So the example I have here is using, um, is a kind of clone of the host gateway plugin. So it's just doing an IP route add and an IP route del uh, each time a new host is added to your Kubernetes cluster or removed. 
uh, and that's, that's kind of all it takes to, to make this kind of prototype clone of the, of the host gateway backend. Um, the itch that I was scratching creating this was actually I wanted to try out VXLAN, a new approach to VXLAN. Um, so this plugin kind of makes the easy stuff easy and the hard stuff possible. I wouldn't really promote uh, writing this big complex chunk of, uh, of shell script. Um, but yeah, this, uh, it is at least possible to, uh, to do quite complicated things with this extension plugin. Uh, so I talked about uh, Flannel. I want to focus on back on, uh, on Calico now. So it has generally the same kinds of challenges as working with, uh, with Calico when it comes to testing. It's written in Go, so compiling is quick. But when you're working on a distributed system, um, copying everything around can be challenging. Um, it does have more components than Flannel, so I'd recommend reading the documentation we have over at docs.projectcalico.org for some guidance there. Um, but yeah, generally broadly the same challenges as Flannel, so I recommend using KubeADM and Minikube to help with testing, and then there's a, a testing framework checked in as well. Uh, so I want to uh, focus in a bit on CNI and talk about that with, with Calico. Um, this applies to Flannel as well, which also has a, a CNI plugin. Uh, so generally, when, when working with the code, I'd recommend trying to run it as natively as possible and just running binaries directly, um, not running it under Kubernetes if you can, at least when you're starting, to try and get that, that quick code debug cycle. Um, so the, the CNI interface is reasonably small. You, to run a CNI plugin, you need to pass in some JSON and set some environment environment variables. So how I like to work is just echoing in this JSON, piping it to the process, and uh, setting the environment on the command line. And that makes for very quick iteration. Uh, it's also possible to run CNI plugins under Docker as well. So the second example I have there uh, is very handy for seeing how different versions of CNI plugins um, handle different input. Um, so you can just change that one number um, against the the plugin there, run through that and uh, see the different responses. Um, so I want to, to demo actually making a, a real change to CNI plugin and running it under Kubernetes, but I think my demo environment's not going to work. Uh, but I have another video, so I might as well show that. Um, yeah, you wouldn't know any different. So I have my same cluster as before. Um, no, that's the same video as before. Let's try again. Ah, here we go. Okay, so um, the logs that the uh, that CNI plugins produce when they're run under Kubernetes um, are logged by the kubelet. So I can look at the the log output from a CNI plugin by uh, here I'm SSHing to my master node, running journal cuttle, looking at the kubelet logs, and grepping that for Calico CNI. And if I look at the logs there, I can see um, those two logs at the end saying Calico CNI releasing IP address. Uh, I think that's maybe a log that could be improved. Maybe we want to know which, um, which plugin is actually releasing the IP address. So I'm going to show you actually changing that log line, recompiling the code, and um, and deploying that, and hopefully we'll see that that's quite easy. So I found the log line that needs changing, and I've just added the details of the the IPAM type that's being run, so the name of the plugin. Um, so I've made that change, and I actually have a little script here which is just going to compile it. So I'm running the build in a container. You can run it. Um, you can do the build natively, it is just a go build, but um, for ease of use it's there in a container as well. Um, and that's doing the build, it's going to rebuild the IPAM plugin as well. Uh, so after I've done that build, I can run the version command on it and check that I have actually changed the code, uh, check what the version reports as now. So I'm going to do that, and it should show as being dirty, so it's based on 1.83, but it now has my changes in. I'm going to cordon off the uh, two of the nodes, N2 and N3, uh, just so I know that I can look for these logs on the on N1. 
and I can check for the, the version of the plugin at the moment on N1 is 1.83. Um, so I want to go in and copy my new plugin that I've just compiled locally onto that server. Um, so that's copied up, uh, it's quite quick, and I can then just check that, yeah, now 1.8.3-30 is on the server. So now if I grep those logs again, um, so I'm just watching the, the logs and run a container that's gonna exit straight away so I can see that releasing, um, that releasing message, I can see that it comes up and it has my new log on there, um, same plugin that it's using. So it's quite, uh, even though um, trying to test on a, uh, a distributed system with multiple hosts, uh, it's not that hard to just, for example, copy um, CNI plugins around. Uh, so that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say. Hopefully I've uh, given you a little bit of background on the two projects um, and given you some ideas for ways that you can contribute and, uh, and how to go about doing that. Um, my uh, demos are available online there and I'll uh, tweet out a link to these slides. Um, so thanks for listening and we're hiring. Uh, I think we have a few minutes left, so if there are any questions. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned that there were things that Calico supports for um, security policy that are not part of the Kubernetes network policy API. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about what those are and why they were not included in network policy API? Uh, I can talk about the first of those. So I think the, the key one is uh, egress policy. So um, I think the uh, Kubernetes network policy API only has ingress policy, so you can only say the uh, connections that you're allowing in, you can't control outgoing traffic. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure about the why. Like Flannel, do you have any limitations on Calico? Like specific to uh, BGP tunneling? Um, so, uh, Flannel provides the different networking backends like QDP and VXLAN and the cloud integrations, uh, and that's operating at that uh, networking layer. Um, I think I have some diagram. Um, uh, Calico does the policy enforcement, so the middle layer on this diagram. It can also do the BGP stuff, and if it's doing BGP, then you're not using Flannel, you're just using Calico uh, and Calico networking as well. So there's no, there's no problem with uh, using the policy enforcement layer of Calico on top of Flannel, but if you're using Calico for networking as well, then you, you wouldn't use Flannel, it's a replacement. Did you say you don't need uh, etcd anymore for Flannel, and what do you do for to keep state? Uh, so the uh, state is stored using the Kubernetes API. So it, it uh, reads and writes to the Kubernetes API server and it stores the state as annotations on the node objects. So you can use kubectl, uh, get nodes, output YAML or whatever to show you the full details of all the annotations on that node and you can see uh, it's just a few, a few lines that Flannel adds there. Um, so Calico has that same support of talking to um, Kubernetes as well. Uh, currently, that's focused more on third-party resources rather than uh, node annotations. Cool. I think that's everyone. Thanks. Thank you very much.